Good evening, everybody, and a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to ICRIA's fifth Kebilal Memorial Lecture that is going to be delivered by Nobel Laureate Professor Michael Spence. Before Professor Spence begins <coughs> his talk, may I request our chairperson, Dr. Aluwalia, to please chair the session. Dr. Mike Spence, Dr. Rajat Kathuria, friends and members of the Lal family, a very warm welcome to you all. Dr. Kebilal Memorial Lecture is a flagship event of ICRIA that we are very proud of, and we have been very fortunate always in getting extremely eminent persons to come and speak for this lecture. This is our fifth Kebilal Memorial Lecture. Uh, Dr. Lal, as many of you know, was a visionary. In fact, he was a man ahead of his times. He set up a career in 1981, uh, at a time when uh, most research institutions just took it for granted that India was a closed economy. And Dr. Lal saw the need for integration with the world economy, and he said, we need an institution which will focus on research, on international economic relations. He saw how and why our economic policy and foreign policy uh, needs must come together. The, uh, I would like to just say a few words about our founder chairman, who we are very, very proud of. Uh, many of us, uh, remember him as a former defense secretary during the critical early 1970s when the Bangladesh war took place. And we remember him as commerce secretary, uh, um, you know, uh, soon thereafter. But even I was not aware of the fact that in 1948, Dr. K. Bilal worked with Sardar Patel to look after the riot victims in Delhi, and he played a major role in uh, the integration of the Madhya Bharat states as uh, uh, the Indian nation uh, came together. So we uh, start with a person with his roots in integrating India, and then moving on to looking for uh, strategic links with the rest of the world and recognizing that we need research in order to make this transition from a closed economy to uh, uh, find our place in the global uh, 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 scenario. In fact, um, in, when he was, uh, you know, he had held a number of positions. Uh, he was ambassador of India to the European Economic Community. And it was at that time when he actually uh, um, brought forth the concept of economic partnership with the uh, um, EC because um, uh, the countries of South Asia were non-associable at that time with the uh, uh, European countries. And we've come a long way from that to the EU with whom we now have a strategic partnership. He was the first chairman of the Group of 77. I mean, I could just go on, uh, but I would just say that we at ICRIA are very proud of our founder chairman and hope that we can live up to the expectations that he had of uh, 
uh, uh, ICRIA. Now this year, I have the great pleasure and honor to welcome Professor Mike Spence, who has agreed to deliver the fifth Kebilal Memorial Lecture. Um, the first lecture was given by Mervyn King, uh, and uh, um, we've had in the past uh, a, a number of very distinguished speakers who've given this lecture. Um, Michael Spence is professor of economics at the Stern School of uh, uh, um, New York University. But as you all know, he is a Nobel laureate. He received his Nobel Prize in uh, Economic Sciences in 2001. And he uh, carries it very lightly on his shoulders. And I think I always wondered how and why he did that. And then I found you have a, a, a detailed uh, you know, a brochure of his uh, uh, you know, career with you, so I wouldn't go into the details. But I believe uh, uh, Professor Spence, among his various awards, received the John Kenneth Galbraith Prize for Excellence in Teaching, which I'm sure he's very proud of. Uh, he was a teacher to my son when uh, he was dean at the Graduate School of Business at Stanford. And uh, uh, in India, he has been uh, famous, apart from being the Nobel laureate, that you know they get famous all over the world. Another time when we all heard a lot about Professor Spence was when he chaired the Independent Commission on Growth. Um, nicknamed Growth Commission. And uh, he uh, sort of, you know, at that time, he really made a mark in terms of uh, uh, setting out uh, the, um, the challenge of uh, uh, getting to sustainable growth, what were the practices across the world, and the, uh, the commission report tells us what you should do to get on the right path and also what you should not do learning from other people's mistakes in, in trying to get there. It was a report which was extremely well received and well reviewed in all the developing countries. And today, uh, Professor Spence is going to be speaking to us on growth prospects and challenges in the coming decade. We've come uh, to a very different spot from the time when the Growth Commission report was written. And as I was uh, uh, asking him earlier on, he himself has also come to a very different spot physically in moving from the US to Europe. And I'm sure where you are also changes your perspective on how you look at things. What I'm very happy at is that he has um, given a subtitle to his lecture which says building blocks of sustainable economic growth strategies. And I have to uh, 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 confess here that at ICRIA for the past 25 years or so, we thought that we were ahead of the curve because we were looking at global competitiveness and what all we needed to do to uh, make it into the uh, big world. But of late, for the past three, four years, we've also realized that growth without sustainability will not work. And there are two areas in particular where ICRIA is focusing its research in a big way. And these are the areas of urbanization, which poses challenges of sustainability for growth, and climate change. Uh, so I'm very happy to see that Professor Spence is going to give us a perspective which is not just about growth and rising incomes and inclusion, but also how it can be made durable and sustainable. So with this uh, long introduction, uh, I, I felt I had to do that because this is a very special occasion for Ikria Mike, so I hope you'll forgive me. I normally don't give such long welcome remarks. But with this, let me now invite Professor Spence to deliver the lecture.
Um, thank you, Isher. Um, thank you, Rajat. Thank you, Montek. Um, it's wonderful to be back here, uh, seeing old friends and people who've made such a difference in not only in this country but the in the in the global economy uh, in general. And it's an honor. Uh, I was delighted you took the time to describe uh, Dr. K. B. Lal. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I actually took a look at the, my predecessors. Mervyn King was the first. I ran into him at NYU where he's hanging out decompressing by surprise, I might add. He looked at me and said, what are you doing, Mike, here? And I said, well, I am work here. What are you doing here? He told me a story um, which makes me think that we could use uh, Dr. Lal or somebody like him in the United States. He went to a high-level conference in Chicago uh, sometime during the fall, a uh, two-day conference on sort of economic challenges. And in those two days, the rest of the world was not mentioned a single time. Uh, so we've got a little distance to go. I'm going to try to convince you that at least the part of the world I've been thinking about, the dynamics, uh, that's a, a fairly big mistake. Anyway, it's a thrill to be here, and uh, I don't have an infinite amount of time. What I'm going to try to do is describe or help us understand the challenges and the recovery processes and so on that we're seeing in various parts of the world. Uh, so let me just launch in. Um, as, as Isher said, the Growth Commission at some point decided to focus on bad ideas as well as good ideas. That was actually Montek Alawalia's idea, good idea, I might add. And so we did that. It turned out it was the most popular part of the growth report. Uh, there were something like 20 of them in two pages, and we started getting emails. You know, people were just thrilled. You know, my government's doing almost all of them, that sort of, you know, stuff. <clears throat> and it turns out that people have been very inventive uh, in concocting defective growth models. Uh, and what I want to convince you of today is it's a lot easier to concoct effective growth models in open economies in the context of a, a global economy, even when it's not distorted, but certainly when it's distorted. Uh, and this is just a list of a few of them. I'm going to talk about the ones that are particularly pertinent uh, now, ones that are systemically important. But you know, people have tried the import substitution model. Uh, Canada, Australia, New Zealand had ex excess diversification models buttressed by essentially tariffs, and that eventually got so expensive they all abandoned it. I grew up in Canada, so I kind of watched that pretty closely. The troubled advanced countries are on some version of an excess aggregate, domestic aggregate demand model propped up by debt and so on, and I'll talk in more detail about that. Um, and then there, there are others. The China one is almost the, the mirror image. It's an excess reliance on the tradable sector and an excess reliance on investment to the point they're driving it into low return territory. So why do these structural things matter? I just put this up. It's a quote from something I just wrote. Uh, and the straight answer is that it's almost impossible, in my judgment, to understand the growth dynamics in advanced and developing countries and the potential for defective growth patterns and understand the timing and nature of the recovery processes without paying attention to both supply and demand and without the distinction between the tradable and non-tradable sector. If you look at the global economy right now, it's pretty easy to give a snapshot. Uh, and this is a, a, a brief version of it. The United States is in what I call a partial recovery. They were growing at one and a half to two percent in real terms. This is driven almost entirely by the private sector. Uh, the fiscal sector has now become a drag, uh, but the private sector is moving pretty aggressively in, the, in, in a kind of restructuring, uh, moving toward external demand on the tradable side. Europe, I'm afraid I have to tell you, is, not, is going to be a non-player in terms of growth for an extended period of time. And that has to do, and that is notwithstanding the fact that uh, the systemic risk associated with the multiple equilibrium structure uh, of the sovereign debt markets in the, in the Eurozone has essentially gone away thanks to the ECB under Mario Draghi with backing from Germany. 
so we have stable sovereign debt markets uh, with yields that are manageable from a fiscal point of view. Uh, and that's a good thing. And that was the only thing we were focused on for a good chunk of time. But we still have major, major uh, problems in the structure and in the way economies uh, conducted themselves in the first 10 years after, uh, after the euro came into existence that, that are going to take years to get out of. China, I think, is uh, obviously systemically important. It is uh, evolving a new growth pattern that is more reliant on the domestic economy. There are views all over the place about whether they're going to pull this off. Um, I think the majority view now is somewhat optimistic. It's going to take a decade uh, to do, but if they do pull it off with a possible lull below 7% next year, I think we're, we can count on something like 7 plus percent growth for probably a better part of a decade, at which point it pretty much has to slow down. Advanced countries don't grow at these speeds. And I think the major and emerging economies, which have had the headwinds from low growth in the advanced economies and a whole lot of volatility created by unconventional monetary and other policies are actually in the process of uh, restoring a relatively high uh, sustainable pattern of growth. So on that front, I'd be pretty optimistic. This is just a little data. I think the mega trend uh, in the global economy is convergence. Um, if you go back 25 years, developing countries are probably 30% of the global economy. They're now over 50%. Uh, this is transforming so many things, I, I won't even begin to describe them, but, but it's the major event of our century uh, for sure. Um, I did this just to calibrate uh, and, and particular to highlight how it is that China has become such a centrally important part of the global economy. On the left-hand side of that graph is China's current GDP. It's about half the size of the United States or Europe, and within something like a decade to 15 years of being on a par in terms of sheer size, not per capita income. And then there are the other major economies, including India, which is the other future economic giant. Um, and if you add them all together, you get something that's a little bit larger than China is now and not growing quite as fast. So that's the current kind of configuration uh, from the point of view of systemically important rising import and, fu and certainly future important developing countries. Another trend that I think I want to just put in behind the analysis I'm going to give you is that the tradable sector of the global economy, which means the fraction of the global economy that is, for practical speaking, in the category of goods and services that can be traded, that is produced in one country and produced in another. That fraction is clearly rising, and the export share of the global economy sort of shows that. This is a picture, they have been having fun at the IMF doing this. This is a picture in terms of trade, you can do this for finance, of the network structure of the global economy. And once again, this is evolving extremely quickly. I put this up not because I want to sort of track around all these little lines, but to say that in this world, uh, when you're trying to assess anything to do with growth in any particular country, you have to have some sense of where it sits in this network. Uh, because the external demand is so important you need to know where it is and where it's, and, and it's, and the target destination for the supply side of the tradable part of the economy, you need to know as well. And finally, something we talked a bit about last night uh, over dinner, the global supply chains are becoming much, much more complex. Uh, my friend, our friend, Victor Fung, in, in Hong Kong, who runs one of the major sort of supply chains in consumer products and has for most of the post-war period, has had a front row seat on that. He describes this process as atomization. What is going on is that, that technology and sort of management learning has created situations in which you can construct a global supply chain with pieces all over the world and not have it lose much in terms of efficiency. And so, and so when you look at what happens, this is exactly what is happening. Uh, and so one of the consequences of that is that when you kind of look inside an economy, you can find things that are highly competitive and part of global supply chains. You used to be able to see things sitting beside them 
that were there because proximity mattered, well, they're not sitting there anymore. Right? If, there, if there's a better place to do it because of human resources and infrastructure and so on, it will go there. It, the kind of simple way to say that is on the tradable side of the global economy, things are getting very, very competitive. Um, if you, now I'm going to switch and sort of talk a little bit about sort of growth. Um, we know from the work of Solo and Swan that the long run determinants of uh, growth are innovation that drives total factor productivity. Uh, we're pretty sure from experience that one of the key inputs to that is di the dynamic aspects of competition, entry and exit. And most, mo most of the progress in modeling uh, growth has, has been in this area. It is focused on the supply side. And the implicit assumption in most of those models is that the economy is a standalone entity. That is, there isn't much that looks like the global economy sitting around it. And I think what has happened is this has caused us beyond the realm of, you know, cyclical, the study of cyclical phenomena and Keynesian responses and so on to forget about demand in a way that's, been, that's hampered our ability to try to understand the actual dynamics that go on in, in economies. And so what I want to do is to, to suggest to you, uh, first by talking a bit about it in general and then by looking at the United States, the challenges in Europe and the Chinese case, to explain to you why I think this is, this is important. What I'm not talking about today are the very long run challenges, but my, my view is if we don't learn how to do better at detecting these gro defective growth models and responding to them, and there are a lot of them in a global economy, then we're going to have a lot of trouble getting our attention around to some of the longer term issues. So the argument is something like this. In open economies, not only the level of aggregate demand, but its composition matters in terms of sustainability and balance. Uh, the, it, it won't surprise you to know that demand drives the supply side of an economy. That is the set of signals to which the supply side responds. Um, now the level can fall short. We've seen lots of examples of demand shocks, but the composition uh, can be out of balance as well. So just two words on that. Uh, if I leave you with nothing else, it's, it will be the notion that you have to pay attention to the distinction between the tradable and the non-tradable side of the economy. Because how they move and in response to what kind of demand is fundamentally different. What does the composition of demand mean? Well, you can break it down as far as you want, but roughly speaking, aggregate demand in any economy breaks down between the consumer and, and consumption, a government, meaning government expenditures and delivery of services, and then investment, which we learned in the Growth Commission work, has to be divided into private sector investment and public sector investment in things like health, education, infrastructure, and so on, that has a, an immediate direct effect on the level and returns to private sector investment. And many economies get out of balance in that composition. And this is what I want to show you uh, today. I'll try to be convincing about it. In, 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 let, let's just take excess domestic aggregate demand. In a closed economy, that is one has relatively little connection with the global economy, if you have excess aggregate demand, you get inflation then it either gets out of control or the central bank steps in. That's just not true in a global economy. You can run a current account deficit or a current account surplus for quite a long time and, and, and increase the indebtedness or increase the holding of assets depending on which side of that thing you're on. Now, I don't mean that's automatically a defective growth model, but you can see that if there are dangers in that kind of pattern, uh, there are dangers that are only present in, a, in the context of an open economy. This is a stupid picture, but I, I just want you to, <laughs> I keep forcing myself to sort of look at it. Basically, all this says is an economy has a tradable and a non-tradable side and a demand and a supply side. Demand is on the left, supply is on the right, tradable and non-tradable goes up and down. 
And what basically what it says is that the tradable, the non-tradable side of an economy, the supply sides and the demand sides, once markets resolve everything, have to look alike. Uh, in a closed economy, it's as if everything's non-tradable. But the tradable side is much more complicated. So trade tradable demand is met from domestic sources and from foreign sources of supply. And tradable supply has target markets in the domestic market and in the foreign markets. Now I think you can see where I'm going. So, in, so I'll tell a story really quickly. T take the current conditions in many economies, which is a big negative demand shock. What precedes that? What precedes it is a pattern of growth using leverage, financial trickery, government spending. There are a hundred different versions of it that elevates domestic aggregate demand to levels that you can't keep up over long periods of time. And typically, and that's a defective growth model, and typically it's a dangerous one because it breaks. And when it breaks, you have a crisis. Uh, that's as far as most people get. But before I get to the rest of the story, let me tell you the other consequence of elevating domestic aggregate demand above a sustainable level. The other consequence is you compete for resources in the factor markets. And by competing for them, you drive them up. And at the margin, you reduce the scope of the tradable sector. Okay? You make yourself, you don't, what, you don't write yourself out of the tradable sector, but at the margin, you, you put yourself out. It turns out in advanced economies, and maybe in others, that what, what you write yourself out of are the labor-intensive ones. So you have a bigger negative effect on employment than you do on... That's the structural, you know, what lies behind that growth pattern in terms of structure. Now the, now the, now the thing breaks, and you have a big negative demand shock, well, much less domestic aggregate demand than you had. Consequence one, the, the non-tradable sector is dead in the water. There is nowhere to go. Consequence two, a little bit, varies a lot with economies, uh, of the tradable sector is also hit negatively. But there's still external demand. And so what you would expect in an economy that's trying to recover from a defective growth problem and a negative demand shock is that resources will start to flow toward the demand that still exists. Now there's more to the recovery. I mean, there's fixing people's balance sheets and, and delevering and a whole lot of other things. So I don't want to oversimplify this, but I am emphasizing the structural change. And that is not only sensible in the short run, but it's part of rebalancing the structure of growth in the economy. And what I hope to show you is that is exactly ha what is happening in economies that have the flexibility. So what are the key inputs to that process? There are two, really. One, policy doesn't do anything that artificially restores the domestic aggregate demand because that, while it seems like a good idea, and from a Keynesian point of view, if you're relatively relaxed, about how much government debt you can have seems like a great idea, carried to extremes, either on the fiscal side, plus or minus, or the monetary side will actually stall or impede or slow down the structural change on the tradable side of the economy. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over some of this and then talk to you a little bit about the American economy. So you can actually see this happen, right? I'm sorry, I skipped the other cri critical condition. The economy's flexible in the factor markets. That is, the labor markets don't get in the way, you know, of shutting some stuff down and moving it. Uh, the capital markets can move capital and so on. So that kind of flexibility is critical uh, to determining the speed with which this happens. It'll happen in any economy. It's just that it can be painfully slow or relatively quick. So what these graphs are, is a picture of the American economy coming out of the crisis. And the ones you want to focus, you know, they compare different, quote, recessions that we've had. The blue one uh, is the one that I'm focused on. So 
we had a big negative demand shock. It showed up in imports, and imports have sort of clawed their way back to where they were in 2008. However, if you look at exports, and the exports aren't a big part of the story in the American economy, they're way back above that. Okay, 